And I must say, it is wonderful to be here in beautiful Vancouver. Um, and uh, yes, I will be talking today about reading and writing personal digital collections. So this is just a brief outline of my talk today. I'll spend a few moments going uh, over my broader research agenda, and then I'll move right into talking about um, an extended project uh, on personal digital collections that currently involves three separate studies, the first one being a literary analysis and fo followed by two user experiments. So agenda considers collections as a form of creative expression. Collections are groups of information-bearing objects, typically selected, described, and arranged for a particular purpose, from libraries to supermarkets, from Facebook to YouTube. In fact, students in one of my courses this semester are, at this moment, writing papers on the supermarket. Um, I explore the means by which collections apply an interpretive frame to the resources that they gather, enacting a viewpoint onto their content, contents. I can also describe my research program in terms of the famous antelope. In his well-known article concerning the nature of documents, Michael Buckland discusses Suzanne Brier's contention that an antelope in a zoo is a type of document. Extending Brier's ideas, Buckland suggests that an object's significance as information arises from the system in which it is embedded. The antelope in its natural habitat, grazing on the African savanna, does not act as a document because there is no reason to notice it. However, the same antelope in a zoo does act as a document because it has been selected and placed within a sort of collection with the circumstances of its description and arrangement focusing on certain characteristics. The antelope in a zoo is framed as a type of specimen, acting as a representative of African wildlife. I investigate how collections, like the zoo, suggest particular meanings for their contents, like the antelope. I use this knowledge to think about how to design collections as forms of expressive media. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to concentrate on one type of collection that I've been interested in recently, the personal digital collection. A personal digital collection is created by selecting and also describing and arranging a subset of a larger library of items. Examples include making a wish list on Amazon, a playlist on iTunes, a gallery of other people's photographs on Flickr, and a board on the currently popular Pinterest. Terms like curating or filtering are often used to describe such activities. Sometimes we can look at a collection and see clear organizational or classificatory principles that give it this Pinterest user identifies and describes user interface concepts via a set of illustrative examples that have been annotated to describe their significance as good user interface practices. For example, according to this collection, providing specific error messages for each omission that a user can make when filling out a web form is an example of good practice. In other words, this Pinterest user makes it fairly easy to see the principles by which the selected items constitute a coherent group. But many, in fact perhaps most collections, are more like this example. The author's basis for declaring these recipes delicious is not readily apparent. Certainly putting these recipes together and not other recipes does say something but it's more ambiguous, less coherent, and I would suggest less illuminating, less interesting to read. In contrast, this example clarifies the significance of the items in the collection. They illustrate aesthetic connections between art and architecture, and there is a hint of an animating personality providing certain character to that sense of significance. 
But can we describe what's going on here a little more precisely to talk about how these examples are communicating differently? What makes one collection of items more expressive, more interesting to read than another collection? What does it mean to write a collection well? These questions provide the initial motivation for my work in this space. I've addressed these questions via two complementary modes of inquiry. One oriented around humanistic criticism, and a second mode leading from the first that uses ideas generated from the critical exercise to inform a set of user experiments. One of the interesting and, dare I say, novel elements of this extended project is in the integration of these two research modes, in taking the work of understanding these artifacts as expressive media and then thinking about how to apply that understanding towards design, towards identifying what sort of environments and tools might facilitate the writing of collections that are interesting to read. So now I'll move into talking about the first study. The humanities, of course, have long scholarly traditions that interrogate various forms of creative expression through systematic critical inquiry. One result of this form of scholarship is to develop a vocabulary of the textual effects that contribute to overall expression, as well as to detail how these effects might My goal in this initial work was to identify such expressive effects or characteristics or qualities that might be produced through the mechanisms of resource selection, resource description, and resource arrangement. And by description, I mean metadata, annotations, labels, tags, categories. And by arrangement, I mean order, relations between items and categories. So here's an example from poetry to clarify what I'm talking about here. A poem might use the mechanism of figurative language, which includes things like metaphor and illusion, to convey the quality or characteristic of idea compression how to concentrate a complex idea in a few evocative words. This line from the English Renaissance poet Thomas Campion provides an example of how a textual mechanism produces a particular characteristic or quality. In the line from Campion's poem, the mechanism of figurative language, here metaphor, her face is a garden with roses growing in it, enables the quality of idea compression. Here, the poem subject is not just beautiful, but young and growing, potentially fertile, like a garden. The interaction design researchers Logren and Stolterman have proposed this sort of critical vocabulary for interactive artifacts with their idea of use qualities. Logren and Stolterman describe how, for example, the split code design window in Dreamweaver and other HTML editors exemplifies a more general mechanism of mirroring that enables a particular quality, which they name as transparency. In my first set of engagements with personal digital collections, I proposed a set of qualities or characteristics that distinguish expressive personal collections, ones that are interesting to read, collections that present an idea to an audience. This humanistic study employed textual analysis to propose three qualities that contribute to collection expressiveness. Original goals for collecting and describing, a unique authorial voice, and engagement with emotional experience. All these characteristics are produced through combinations of the three mechanisms of selection, description, and arrangement of resources. And I should note that I only propose that these characteristics exist not that they are the only such characteristics that might exist. The characteristic of original purpose involves a distinctive motive for selecting the items within the collection. For example, the Kansas City Police Department created this Pinterest board to educate citizens on how to spot illegal drugs in their communities. This board expresses a foundational belief that controlling drug-related activities is necessary to maintaining safe environments and is any citizen's duty. The characteristic of voice involves the presentation of a unique authorial persona to reveal greater depth in the collection's meaning. So the kid who created this cycling Pinterest board 
describes himself this way. Some people think me a snob. I like to consider myself a merchant of cool. The overall purpose for this board might be only to highlight the author's preferences for gear and equipment, which is really a fairly generic purpose. But the combination of snark, enthusiasm, and expertise makes it interesting to read. So the guy in the orange jacket in the middle there is described in an annotation as a visual definition of the word fail, for example. The final characteristic, emotional intimacy, involves the revelation of personal feeling as a means to greater understanding of the collection's contents. This Pinterest author talks about badly wanting a Cabbage Patch doll, a very popular toy in the 1980s, but not being able to get one initially because it was too expensive. She was finally given a doll some years later after they started to get cheaper, and she treasured it. Eventually, she gave it to her own daughter, who didn't have the same connection with the doll and played roughly with it and destroyed it. This sort of connection takes the collection as a document to a completely different plane than if there was no story, than if there was just a picture of the doll. So by conducting this literary analysis and identifying these characteristics, I felt like I was beginning to understand and interpret personal digital collections in a deeper and more sophisticated way as a critic. But it was frustrating to me that despite all of this potential to write collections that could be poetic, as Umberto Eco defines the poetry of Liss, relatively few personal collections exhibit these expressive characteristics at all, let alone in a compelling way. So I began to think about this from a design perspective. I wondered, are users creating the collections they do because they don't know how to write them well? Just as writers are often advised to read others' work in order to develop their own skills, would interacting with example collections that do exhibit these expressive characteristics have any effect on how potential users understand and create personal digital collections? So I convinced a colleague of mine in Texas, Gary Geisler, that this was a wonderful opportunity to use his software for digital video libraries. And together, we coerced a few students into helping us conduct a user experiment. And I will move into talking about that first experiment. This study was focused around the following research questions. Uh, for what purposes do people create their own and use others' personal digital collections? How do people conceptualize the design process for creating their own collections? And for me, more, more interestingly, how does exposure to examples of expressive collections affect how people create their own? To prepare a controlled environment for our study, we created two themed video libraries implemented using Gary's Open Video Digital Library Toolkit, the OVDLT an easy-to-use digital library system for video that includes facilities for users to create personal collections called playlists in the OVDLT interface. The playlist feature in the OVDLT enables users to title a collection, to add videos to it, and to include a description of the playlist as a whole, as well as individual annotations for each video. And in the slide here, um, the Texas Longhorns, which is the first video in this playlist, the um, bit in italics is the annotation added by the creator of the collection. The little bit not in italics, a herd of Texas Longhorns, um, is uh, from the general metadata for that item. In selecting themes for our test libraries, we decided on sustainability and Texas as subject domains with wide-ranging expressive potential. Citizens of Texas, where our study was conducted, tend to have a certain intense pride in their state in a way that is quite singular. 
to enable study participants to explore and select videos without necessarily watching them, we developed a set of browsing categories for each collection and cataloged the videos extensively with a variety of descriptive metadata, which we created according to strict editorial rules to ensure consistency across records. And this is just an example of the video metadata. Our study protocol unfolded this way. Participants were first instructed on the OVDLT interface, and they created a practice playlist. Then, participants were alternately introduced to one of the test libraries, so half saw sustainability first and half saw Texas first, and they were asked to create their own collection with it according to a brief scenario. So for sustainability, we asked participants to create a playlist that inspired people to be more sustainable. Following a brief interview, participants were then shown two examples of expressive personal collections based on the same library that they had just been working with. After reviewing the examples, participants provided their impressions of the sample collections and compared them to the collections that they had just made. Then participants were introduced to the second test library and asked to create a second personal collection. Our sample collections were created to embody the three expressive characteristics identified in the initial humanistic study and to display different approaches to the subject matter at hand. And I'll just show one brief excerpt here from the example collection Goodbye Texas. So part of the overall uh, descriptive annotation for this collection reads, this collection of videos describes only some of the many reasons I hate this state. This got a lot of spirited response from our participants. In contrast, the other sample for the Texas Library was called the Non-Texans Guide to Visiting Austin, which provides a rather different and less polarizing perspective on the same source content. Twelve participants completed the protocol, and each one created two collections, in addition to responding to interview questions. We assessed each participant collection and each of the four examples for relative presence of the three expressive characteristics, purpose, voice, and emotional intimacy, as created through the selection, description, and arrangement of videos. So... The whole project of figuring out how to compare the expressiveness of any document is indeed a tricky endeavor because we are dealing with attributes like authorial voice that are not really measurable in the standard sense of measuring. Um, we can actually talk a lot about that, but I will try to keep it brief. My basic approach was to assimilate the goals of writing assessment. So, for example, where raters attempt to sort student essays into proficiency levels for placement in an appropriate composition course. The goal here is to reliably sort the essays into ranges based on standard criteria, even though the actual rationale for what makes an essay fit in one range or another might be quite different from essay to essay or from rater to rater. Our goal as well was only to enable this type of roughly reliable sorting through a systematic process for focusing attention on the collections in specific ways. Unlike in some forms of coding for qualitative data, we did not attempt to reach agreement on ratings. That would have actually been contrary to what we were trying to do. We expected mild discrepancies and we looked at more significant discrepancies as themselves interesting data points to be further examined. Again, the comparison to writing assessment is useful. It is expected that graders will potentially identify an essay's strengths and weaknesses somewhat differently. And if the scores are widely divergent, then it is productive to identify the causes of that discrepancy. To ensure that any such discrepancies resulted only from principled interpretive differences, we performed rigorous process checks to ensure that each rater understood the expressive characteristics and the protocol in the same way. Practically, we used a combination of free text summarization and structured coding to demonstrate how each expressive characteristic appeared in a collection through resource selection, resource description, and arrangement. So for example, we would first look at the idea of original purpose for the collection. Assessors would describe the purpose that they saw in the collection using free text, 
and they would rate the strength of that purpose that they identified on a scale from 1 to 10. Then assessors would use a set of codes to identify all of the places in the collection where different forms of resource selection contributed to the defined purpose. And the codes were things like the creator of a collection item, the content of a collection item, the genre or form of a collection item. We developed the codes based on preliminary review of the actual collections, so these were observed ways of using selection to implement a purpose. If an assessor felt that the content of an item contributed to the collection's purpose that they had identified, then that code would be assigned for that item. Assessors used another set of codes to identify all of the places where description, or things like titles, labels, and annotations, contributed to the purpose. The arrangement of items, their order, um, was hard to control in the OVDLT, so we didn't have codes for that. Um, we did this for each of the three characteristics, and we also provided a rating for overall expressiveness, along with free text rationale for that rating. The overall rating was not an average of the three characteristics to allow for a collection being more or less than the sum of its parts. Each participant collection was assessed by two raters, and the examples were assessed by three raters. Our findings for this study were not really surprising, but they ended up being suggestive, and I'll explain how. Very briefly for the first two questions, participants who created personal collections in their own lives, like YouTube playlists or what have you, did so for personal information management purposes, not for sharing with others, even though their collections were, of course, available to anyone on the internet. And they conceptualized collection creation as selecting resources, but not arranging or describing them, which makes total sense if you are creating a collection for yourself. You don't need to write an, an annotation that explains why you selected what you did and why that's important. However, for our assessors, the contribution of potentially quite complex selection criteria to a collection's expressiveness was almost impossible to identify without some sort of descriptive or arrangement elements. As this table shows, for the assessors, participant collections were much less expressive, in fact, divergently expressive than the example collections, and the differences hold for all three of the expressive characteristics. So the mean for overall expressiveness for the examples is 7.9, and that of the participants, 2.5. And again, you have to look at these numbers as ranges, kind of like grades, so we don't want to overstate the number aspect, but if we do think of it like a B grade compared to an F grade, then we can say that that is a pretty big split. Um, on the other hand, when we look at, say, task one compared to task two, even though there is a small change in numbers, we're still pretty much in the greater F range, so I'm not going to say there's any real difference there. Assessors also noted extensive use of descriptions in the example collections with an average of 43.5 descriptive codes per collection, while the participant collections showed dramatically fewer description effects, about four per collection. Again, not to overstate the numbers, but this indicates a widely divergent use of descriptive elements from the examples to the participants. So regarding our third research question, exposure to the expressive collections did not seem to change how participants approached their design task. But this is where it starts to get a little interesting. So despite consistency in their own design processes from one collection to another, 11 out of the 12 participants noted the use of descriptions in the examples. And further, all of these 11 noted at least one expressive characteristic in the examples, and not, of course, using this terminology, which we never told them about. Um, <clears throat> all 11 of the participants that noticed descriptions in the examples mentioned something having to do with original purpose, 10 mentioned something having to do with authorial voice, and four referred to something having to do with emotional intimacy. So, while brief interactions with our examples did not affect the way that our participants conceptualized writing personal visual collections, participants were nonetheless able to read 
the collections fluently. So what is the dissonance here? Well, maybe the participants actually made a different kind of thing, a different document genre than our examples, even though they look a lot alike in many respects. In other words, the collections made by the participants and the collections made by us as examples are kind of like ice cream and frozen yogurt, which look similar but are nonetheless quite different. <coughs> in current genre theory, um, as uh, described in uh, rhetoric and composition, a genre comprises not just recognizable consistent structural elements, such as line breaks in a poem or the salutation in a letter, but a shared purpose that such conventions serve as maintained and modulated by a group of skilled writers and readers. It is possible, therefore, to have two genres that look similar but work differently, like a business letter and a personal letter, or like ice cream and frozen yogurt. The initial humanistic investigation considered personal digital collections as a single genre, given the structural similarities between all instances of this form. So the mechanisms for expression, selection, description, and arrangement are basically the same, for example. So the differences between collections that exhibited the expressive characteristics and those that did not seemed initially to be differences of degree rather than indicative of speciation. But these findings began to suggest otherwise. So basically, <clears throat> we asked people to write an expressive collection, and they wrote an information management tool. We asked them to write a business letter, and they wrote a letter to mom and dad. Then we asked them to read two expressive collections, and they read them as expressive collections. We had them read a business letter, and they said, oh, this is very professional. Then we asked them to write an expressive collection again, and they wrote an information management tool. Once again, they went to write a business letter, and they wrote a letter to mom and dad instead. Hmm. So my professional background before academia called was in technical communication, and that's all about defining and structuring a task. So I wondered, could we facilitate a genre switch by making sure that participant designers equally considered all of the potential mechanisms for producing expression in collections, description and arrangement in addition to selection? If we tell them that they might want to write an introductory sentence and an action sentence, will they write a business letter or will they write another letter to mom and dad? If we tell them that they might consider using titles and annotations in their collections. Will they write an expressive collection or will they write an information management tool? Let's see what happens. So on to experiment two, but we made a few changes in the setup. To keep the focus on the task and not be restricted by any particular digital environment, we changed the material conditions of the study. We had participants create collections using simple craft materials. Participants pinned paper slips representing source material on cork bulletin boards, along with handwritten labels and annotations. So in this example, the um, black and white slips represent source material, and the colored um, cards are um, labels and annotations. We created source libraries of physical objects instead of digital ones, creating a library of cookbooks and a library of portrait images instead of the themed videos. And we had two test conditions, one in which we split the design task into three explicit steps that each suggested two of the mechanisms for producing expression in collections, and one in which we just had one undifferentiated task. We were very clear in the instructions, which were pre presented orally and in written form, that participants should consider the different mechanisms that we described, but they did not have to do them. <coughs> In the structured task condition, we created three separate stations around the testing room with the appropriate instructions and materials at each station. The first station, shown here with the um, library of portrait images, was to select and arrange. So to choose items from the source library and to arrange potential selections into a, prelim a preliminary sort of order. The second station was to arrange the selected items on a bulletin board and describe the collection as a whole. 
And the third station was to describe individual items and to ensure appropriate selection. And again, the instructions made it clear that participants not actually have to do these things. For example, the instructions for step two in describing the uh, collection as a whole said, a collection title and annotation can help other people understand your collection. A title or annotation can use single words, phrases, whole sentences, or whatever you think is best, including nothing at all. We had 24 participants total, 12 in each test condition, structured and unstructured. Uh, for this study, participants only created one collection. Um, and because the examples didn't actually have an effect in the previous study, um, we had examples available first before the design task, but the examples used different source material than the participants. So uh, the examples used songs, movies, and some different non-portrait art objects. We used the same appraisal protocol as the first study, and we had three assessors for all of the collections, participants, and examples. Our findings here were, let's say, more interesting than we could have expected. So first of all, the task structure had no effect on relative expressiveness. Neither did the source library. However, all of the participant collections as a group were demonstrably more expressive than the previous study. So to continue the analogy with a writing assessment, in both of our experiments, the example collections would be in, say, an advanced composition class. So the mean for overall expressiveness for the second study for the examples was 8, and in the first study was 7.9. Um, <clears throat> in the first experiment, the participant collections as a group would be assigned to the remedial class. Um, but in this study, the participant collections as a group would be assigned to the standard class. Moreover, certain changes in the second study's participant collections pointed towards a general switch in orientation to audience-focused collections instead of personal information management tools, exactly what we hoped would happen. Um, in the first experiment, participants seemed to conceive of their own collections as aggregations of individually uniquely interesting articles in a manner congruent with keeping task of items for one's own private purposes. So when we asked participants in the first study to describe their collections to us, um, they would often talk about reasons for selecting particular items. And this participant is a typical example. I picked the rain garden one because my cousin actually designs rain gardens, so I have an interest in that. I like sun chips, so I picked that one. In contrast, participants in the second experiment were more aware of their collections as designed structures through which a group identity was communicated. The individual items were less important in determining either the character or the success of the collection. When we asked these participants to describe their collections, they consistently talked about the process of generating an overall theme instead of discussing particular items. And participant PB10, B indicates the unstructured task condition, contributes a representative response to this question. I started looking at the cookbooks and I decided to focus on the books that I would probably actually read cover to cover that might tell more of a story rather than just a collection of recipes. These are the ones that I picked out of that and I grouped them on the board according to the stories that they were telling. Another indicator of this focus on the collection instead of the item was participants' use of internal categories to demonstrate and clarify a collection's thematic structure. Neither of the instruction sets mentioned creating categories as a form of description, referring only to titles, labels, and annotations. But 19 out of 24 participants implemented some form of internal categorization scheme. Additionally, participants in the second experiment consistently felt like it was part of their task to ensure that every item in the source library that fit the determined collection structure was included. Accordingly, participants went through all the source materials in a systematic manner, sometimes doing so multiple times as their thematic ideas evolved. And participant PA08 describes this sort of process. Definitely, as I would start to have an idea, I'd go back. I spent a lot of time going back and pulling books one more time to take a closer look to see where they really fell. 
In contrast, in the first study, no participants went through the source library systematically, not even once. Um, some of our participants in the second study took as long as 90 minutes to create a single collection. In the first study, we didn't even track time because no one took very long. So, our participants in the second experiment created structures instead of sets of unique individuals. They created real zoos, in a sense, into which one could put a variety of animals. But why? What made them do this? It wasn't the task structure. <laughs> so uh, we suggest that the changed material conditions in the second experiment allowed a set of framing devices to emerge that foregrounded the idea of the collection as a cohesive structure and a creative product. Um, in the paper that we uh, recently wrote, we describe in some depth various aspects of this cohesiveness, but here I'll concentrate on the idea of framing. Two elements in particular seem to have interacted in producing framing effects, the clearly bounded source library and the blank canvas of the bulletin board. The distinct physical boundaries of both source libraries worked as a thematic framing device by encouraging the systematic sequential browsing through the entire expanse. From the way that participants described the development of their designs, this browsing compels mental categorization as a means to cognitively process the library, which strengthens and encourages the generation of collection themes and the use of internal categories to support those themes. This internal categorization process focuses the collection author's attention on the system of relations between items as the real object of the design process. For example, participant PB06 made sense of the cookbook library as a whole by grouping its items as stages in a pedagogical path to teach cooking. I took a look at all the cookbooks and I realized that cookbooks in general are trying to convey some instruction to people. And so I looked at the larger collection as what would be a good progression through these for them to go through just microwave cooking to be able to throw a dinner party. The bulletin board provided a literal frame that accentuated the collection both as a conceptually expressive and as a purely visual artifact. The open and yet bounded space served as a thematic framing device in emphasizing the collection as a unified whole with a directed flow from top to bottom and side to side. Interacting with the board also put the participant in the role of reader as well as in the role of creator, seeing at the time of creation how the reader would experience the collection, which is not uh, uh, an element of most um, environments for personal digital collections. You never have to interact with the collection as a whole as you create it. These multiple framing devices ultimately ena enabled a sense of freedom through constraint. Just as poets have found artistic expression to be encouraged through established verse forms, so did our participants find the boundaries enacted by our study environment to be creatively liberating. In their own practices in their own lives creating personal digital collections like Pinterest boards, um, participants saw their collecting activities as opportunistic and diffuse um, instead of as concentrated creative episodes. And they saw their collections as dynamic and ongoing but as rather formless. In providing a defined expanse for the source library, the design task and the design product the material conditions enacted by our study scaffolded an approach to collection design that was both more systematic and more creative. While our previous study included some of these limitations, a bounded design task and a relatively small source library, the use of physical materials here enforced the constraints by making them unavoidably apparent, heightening the contrast between the study environment and similar digital activities. So participant PBO3 noted, I feel like online you just kind of have a limitless supply of things that you can pull from. So sometimes it's almost overwhelming. Like you want to get all of them and here you can get all of the men with mustaches, but you cannot find all of the men with mustaches to put on a Pinterest board. So we did not anticipate engaging with notions of materiality in this study. Um, from the beginning, my own conceptual base for digital collections has been as an evolution of systematic bibliography, um, as 
collections, with collections of citations or surrogates. Um, and as with traditional systematic bibliographies, personal digital collections are new creative works in their own right, composed of curated citations to existing works. In the history of bibliography, distinctions have been made according to the content and style of citations and in their organization and arrangement, but not in the material of their representation, um, or even to a great degree in the material being represented. Um, a bibliography of economics, for example, might include text articles and books as well as computer models. In the literature of collecting as well, it is not uncommon to talk of, say, museums and zoos as being more similar than different. But um, as Jean-Francois Blanchet discusses so compellingly in his article on the material history of bits, the material that lies behind any abstraction is only hidden. And when conditions are right, its material nature can make itself apparent as a design element to be reckoned with. In this study, we discovered a situation in which forgotten material characteristics of citation and collection disrupted the smooth flow of abstraction, the stuff that we make the citations out of, and the substrate in which we embedded the citations actually mattered. The question now is, how does the notion of citation material, of collection material, matter in different environments? In considering the design of authoring environments for personal collections and of reading environments for personal digital collections, we should clearly not think about replicating the affordances of a cork board into the digital world. But we might start thinking about the modes of framing that particular sets of material conditions might engender. So to sum it all up, um, throughout its, its existence, the rhetoric of the web has promoted its potential to democratize publishing, enabling individuals to reach audiences without the corporate infrastructure required to produce and disseminate print materials. While the vision has maybe not quite matched the reality, some authors have been able to master new forms, forms like blogs, video clips, and so on, that have enabled them to reach new audiences in compelling ways. Personal digital collections constitute another of these emerging forms, but although many have been produced, collection authors as a whole have yet to exploit their expressive potential. As one of our participants in the second study commented, there is a lot of dreck on Pinterest. In presenting a more complex understanding of personal digital collections as expressive artifacts, and in discovering qualities of authoring environments that may facilitates their production, my work in this extended project contributes to the evolution of the personal digital collection as a creative product. Thank you very much. <laughs>